Today is March 26, 2014, and we are interviewing Lewis Demers. We're at the Adams County Courthouse. And Lewis, how old are you today? I'm 90. Okay. And what is your birthday? 9323. My name is Jamie Fry, and I'll be the interviewer. And Mr. Demers, could you state for the recording what war and what branch of the service you were in? World War II, U.S. Navy. What was your rank? I ended up rating in first class. I'm sorry, you ended up? Rating in first class. Thank you. Yeah. Where did you serve? 99% in the Pacific. Yeah. Did you get immersed in the culture where you were stationed? No. We were on the run all the time. It was all out war. Yeah. Did you bring any mementos or souvenirs back with yeah, you? Yeah, but I can't bring them in here. I brought some knives and stuff like that. I used to sleep with a knife on all the time. Everybody did. You kind of it would get torpedo during the night, you know. You always slept with a knife on for sharks and stuff like that. You know, so. And you were a radio man. What specifically was your job or your assignment? Well, I started out when I first went in as a seaman aboard a, a gun. I had a five-inch thirty-eight gun, and then uh, it was an open turret, which a lot of people don't know what an open turret is. It's not covered. It's, it's all open. And the sea was always so rough, and we was always getting wet and cold and everything. And uh, I seen how these radio men, they, they was inside of what we called a radio shack. And I said, boy, that's for me, you know. So I got to be a radio striker, and then I worked my way up the line. And uh, I was in charge of radio of one aboard the Pittsburgh. In fact, uh, we was going to go in, like I'm getting ahead of my story, we was going to go into Japan and uh, I was going to get a field commission going from Marine to First Class to an instant, which is unheard of, but a captain can do anything during a war if they want to. But uh, anyhow, go ahead, I'm getting off my oh, base you're here. fine, you're fine. <laughs> um, did you see combat? Oh, yes, yeah, I was 23, no, 20, 26 uh, uh, Bronze Stars I had. Were there any casualties in your unit? Quite a few, yeah. yeah. Did you have any injuries? I had shrapnel in my left knee, just, just a little hunk of steel, but uh, not, not enough to qualify for a Purple Heart. Yeah. Were you ever a prisoner of war? No, no, no. Do you want to share any of your experiences um, during battle? Boy, that's, that's a... That's a well, we were scared all the time, you know what I mean? It, just, it was just fighting, 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 and uh, early morning general quarters. And, and uh, we was under a lot of attacks from the kamikazes all the time. And fortunately, none of the ships where I was, was on it. We never took a hit. We took some near misses. They, they used to fly over top of us, machine gun us, strafe us, always heading for the carriers. That, that was their prime target. They always wanted to knock out the carriers. So, but uh, we, uh, at Iwo Jima, we pretty much got sunk by our, uh, another battle wagon was on the other side of the island, and they didn't have their range right, and it was firing over top of Mount Shiribashi, and uh, uh, they, they, f they fire a solid three six-inch projectors at a time, and uh, it went practically through our superstructure, and uh, the captain called down to radio one, said, bring up the, the, uh, the chart of all the different ships all around the island. So he got on what they called the TBS, which is like, well, I don't know how to complain. It was like a ham radio or a CB or whatever, however you want to classify it, and uh, hollered at this captain. And he used some pretty bad language, too. He said, get your range right. You're just about sumpish, you know. So that that's every once in a while that... Uh, you know, friendly fire, you know, should be, but it does. Lack of communications, I guess. So, yeah, that was, that was the worst. Then from there, we went to um, Okinawa, and uh, we bombarded the city of Naha, and uh, we killed a lot of innocent people there, and the women and children, we didn't know it at the time, but the main force was down the southern part of the island. That was their stronghold. But we leveled that, that city, about 65,000 population, and we practically leveled that whole city. But uh, 
Go ahead. It's reminiscing here. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we bypass a lot of islands too. We bypass truck. Truck was like Pearl Harbor to the Japanese. And it was such a strong uh, base that we, and it had a lot of reefs all around it, so you couldn't get in close. So they bypassed it, but we did sink a lot of ships, the, the, the carriers, the, the airplanes off the carrier point, and, and sunk a lot of ships in their harbor, just like they did to us, you know. But, uh, go ahead. <clears throat> Were you awarded any medals or citations? Well, uh, yeah, uh, ship citations, not personally, ship citations, that's, that's all. I got about six or eight, eight medals, I guess. And, uh, occupation of uh, the Philippines, Luzon, and all that, and, and uh, all the different battles we was in. Like I said, we were very, very lucky. How did you get along with the officers and the the other seamen? Well, I'd be better be careful what I say here, but uh, most uh, most of the officers. Got along real good. I, the um, and mostly the officers that came up through the line, the enlisted men that came up through the line, they knew the ropes. And uh, I guess I'm going to say this, I shouldn't, but uh, the officers that come out of Annapolis, I mean, they were they were tough. I mean, they wouldn't give you a break. I mean, you had told the line on practically everything. They 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 could get nasty. They, they could they could lower your morale pretty doggone quick. You can never talk to them unless uh, they talk to you first. And I mean, they, they were just cruel, you know what I mean? But that's enough said about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but, <laughs> but uh, you remember that stuff. You better believe sure. it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I don't think they could walk on water, but I think they thought they could, but I don't know. But that's that. <laughs> All of them are not like that. No. In fact, um, I had a, um, boy, this not bring back memories to me. I had a message for the captain. And uh, because I was in charge of Radio 1, I was designated to go see the captain because very few people got to see the captain. And we went up in the wardrobe room where the officer's quarters, and I was looking for the captain. And here was this gentleman walking up and down the, the uh, the, the forecastle, the, the top, the, the bow of the ship, they call it the forecastle. And uh, he was a real tall guy, had a real nice tan and everything, and the black trunks. I remember it like it was yesterday. He says, come here, sailor. Uh, yes, sir, because I knew he was an officer, yes. but I didn't know who he was. And uh, it turned out to be Admiral Spruance. And, uh, and uh, we talked, and we walked up and down. He said, walk with me, sailor. Where are you from? And he asked me a bunch of questions, and I told him, Illinois, and says, where at? And I said, Quincy. Well, he never heard of Quincy. I said, well, it's it's southwest of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, and then the bridge went nuts. I mean, they, they had their field glasses on me and everything. Wanted to know what that sailor, that swabby down there was walking with the admiral, you know. And I got I got to put on um, what they call captain's mass. And, it, it's, and uh, I had to go before the board of people. And... Um, and they, I said, well, the captain, or the, the admiral, he, I found out later on he was an admiral. I said, well, he asked me to um, walk with him. And uh, I guess at first they didn't believe me, but they did ask the admiral, and all the charges was was canceled out, you know. But that's, that's you know. But anyhow, that's kind of a little story on the side, but, but it's, it scares you all. I mean, it really does, you know. <laughs> you know. But anyhow, I finally found the captain. So. <laughs> so, did you feel uh, pressure, stress, or anxiety? Most of the time, yeah, yeah, because we couldn't sleep much at night, you know, because we was always, we was on, during the war, we was on four hours, all four hours. We stand watch for four hours, you try to sleep when you could, in between your four hours off or four hours on, you had general quarters. You try to do your laundry. You try to eat, you know, mess and stuff like that. So we, we were pretty well stretched out. I mean, because this would go on for days and days and days. And um, Bull Halsey, it, with the Enterprise, he they called it the Ghost Fleet there for a while because we'd attack this base and we'd run 
wide open flank speed, go to another base and, and attack it. And the Japanese thought we had more ships than what we already did. I mean, you know, he was a smart guy. They said he was tough too. One time, we um, we was uh, going to take on some ice cream. They call it gig dunks in in the navy. And um, the quartermaster was at, at at the helm, you know. And um, the carrier, we, we pulled in alongside the carrier, and 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 a, and a captain said, "Well, pull in closer." And um, the helm and the, the quartermaster says, "Sir," he says, "I may get, I may hit the ship and may pull me in." He says, I gave you an order. He says, you go ahead and pull in. He pulled in, and sure enough, the slipstream on the back of the stern of the ship pulled it in, and our superstructure hit the side of the, side of the carrier. And he and he got court-martialed. And he was a lieutenant commander on his tin can, and there was an ensign on the bridge also, and uh, he testified in behalf of the listed man and uh, that, that he was following orders. And it wasn't two weeks afterwards, or I don't know, short time afterwards, the captain, he just disappeared. I don't know where he ever went. They, they relieved him of his command. Yeah. So anyhow, that's kind of a story on the side. Sure. But a, lot, a lot of that stuff went on, you know. Yeah. But, uh, oh, gosh, what else? <laughs> Did you keep a, a diary or a journal? Well, we weren't, we weren't allowed to do that, but I did keep some notes. Because as a radio operator, mm -hmm. I kept some copies of the messages we sent back and forth. I got a stack of them like that. I mean, mm -hmm. from the different admirals and different com, com, uh, back fleet. Yeah. See, I was in the third fleet, the fifth fleet, and the seventh fleet. They kept changing, changing numbers. Just, and some of them were all the same ships. We, some of the ships would leave the task force. Just different new ships would come in, and they would change the numbers just to confuse the, the Japanese. You know, because intelligence, because we just sent a code back and forth, you mm -hmm. know. I was also at the Battle of Midway, and um, the, um, the carrier Yorktown uh, got hit real bad, and uh, we, we took the crew off of it and we went to Cairns, and uh, three days later, they had it under tow, and three days later, a submarine got in, and uh, Torpedoed uh, the uh, the Yorktown, and there was one destroyer alongside of it, and uh, of course it, it, it the, the destroyer it went down in probably two three minutes, and uh, eventually why the um, Yorktown sunk three days later. Japanese did and, and they chased his submarine, and he was pretty smart. He got he got away. He got away. Can you tell us about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Boy, let me see. What, 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 which, what, which one was that? Towards right here. Oh, I already told you about that. Yeah, I was under fire from the that battle wagon on the other side of the... Uh, Mount Shiribashi, I already told you about that. Oh, I saw the first flag go up at um, Iwo Jima. The first flag. The, uh, that happened when I was taking the message up to the bridge and about uh, getting a diagram of the ships all around us. Mm -hmm. And I looked out and there was the flag going up at Iwo Jima. And for a long time, you know, they never mentioned that because later on they came out with a with a flag, they staged this for it to sell bonds, you know. Sure. But I saw the first flag go. That was kind of, I never forgot that, yeah. yeah. Were you able to stay in touch with your family? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes I did. But a lot of times we wouldn't get mail for like 50, 60 days because we was always running, they couldn't catch up with us, you know. So, but, uh, yes, yeah, let's see. Did you have anything uh, special for good luck. Well, picture of my wife. I carried that. My, she was my girlfriend then, and uh, finally, uh, she was engaged. She, uh, uh, I wanted to marry her, but her folks said no. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did give her a ring, an engagement ring, you know. So before you left? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the times I came home, see, 
I was on this destroyer. Oh, I put in for aviation. See, when I first went in the Navy, I wanted to be a pilot. And he said, well, you get through basic training, then you put in for it. So I got through basic training. What did they do? They sent me to Pearl Harbor and I destroyed it. Okay, so I served it. And it came out again about a year later. Uh, I put in for it again. They sent me to Boston, Massachusetts. I got on a heavy cruiser to Boston. And so I went back out in the Pacific through the Panama Canal on that again. So it came up again that we could put in for for aviation again, So it, and also submarine. But I didn't want a submarine. I put in for aviation. For aviation. Guess where they sent me? New London, Connecticut <laughs> for summer school. I was there for two weeks, and they called me in, the commanding officer called me in his office and says, Sir, or Sailor, you're going to Norfolk, Virginia. I said, Norfolk, Virginia? I said, did my bid come through for aviation? He said, no, you're, on, you're going to be put on a light cruiser. See, the, the, the civilian built the ships, and before the Navy signs off on them, you had to go to down what they call a shakedown cruise. See, everything works. They get full power, flank speed, all fire all the guns and everything. So that's where I ended up back on the Vicksburg, back out in the Pacific. And I ended up the war on the Vicksburg okay. in Yokohama Bay, right alongside the Missouri. So that's kind of my. But I didn't, I didn't start flying until after I got out of the Navy. I used my GI Bill. You've got a question there about GI Bill. Yeah. That's where I used my GI Bill. I learned how to fly. Okay. And, and uh, I uh, ended up crop dusting out in Oregon for about a year. And uh, my wife, I was married then, and my wife wouldn't go out there. So I came back. I put in a, a bid for Ozark Airlines. They were hired. I also put in a bid for the CAA. It was the CAA back in those days before mm -hmm. they turned over to the FAA. And, uh, well, they had the CAA called me, and I thought I better take that job for the bird in hands worth two in the bush, like yeah. they used to say, you know. So anyhow, and that's where I ended up with over 30 years with the FAA. So, yeah. Did you have plenty of supplies? Well, uh, yes and no. Um, we went to, um, we went from the South Pacific to the Aleutian Islands. We didn't have any foul weather gear. You know, fall weather gear is heavy jackets and all okay. that stuff, long underwear, all that, long Johnson. We didn't have any of that. That came out later on. Um, anyhow, we, we went to Kis Kiska, Atu, and Adak, and then we went back down to the South Pacific, and that's where our fall weather gear finally caught up with us at the island of Tonga Dabu. Tonga Dabu at that time was a secret base, just like Pearl Harbor was, but it was south of the equator. And that's where our foul weather gear mm -hmm. came in. Like and you it, didn't need it anymore. We didn't need it anymore. <laughs> it was so hot below the decks, we had to, we had to sleep topside all the time. Because, you know, they didn't have air conditions back back in those days, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that's, that's kind of a little, I'll never forget that either. <laughs> How was the food? Fair, fair to poor. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. We, uh, we, we, we sunk a, a submarine up in the Illusions. And we had a few survivors, and they fed those jokers. <laughs> they fed them steaks and everything else, and we were still eating shit on the shingle. Pardon me. <laughs> that's, that's beef and, and a gravy. Sure. So, anyhow. <laughs> All right. Oh, really. How did you keep yourself entertained? Well, we didn't have much free time. And uh, I did play a trumpet. And uh, we had a few guys who would get together on the fantail. That's on the back end of the ship, and we'd, we'd jam back and forth like that, and, and that, that, that's about the most enjoyment we had, you know. Of course, the guys would, would uh, there's a lot of crap, crap shooting games going on, mm -hmm. some of the guys were playing cards, that kind of stuff. We didn't have no movies aboard or anything like that, I mean, you know, until later on, you know, then they start trying to keep the morale up by getting more stuff in, but... No, um, no Bob Hope or that kind of stuff. Or no I mean, entertainers. No, came inter to see no, 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 no. <laughs> this, is, this is all war zone. I mean, you know, right. they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go into a war zone because you know we couldn't protect them because we'd have a heavy time protecting ourselves. You know. Yeah. At, uh, I might add that um, at Okinawa, we we lost twenty nine ships there at Okinawa. A lot of people don't know that the kamikazes. We shot down hundreds of airplanes, but they still they still could get in. 
you know, they still could get in and, uh, and uh, harass it day and night. I mean, so, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys didn't make it. I was one of the lucky ones, you know. So, that's all I can tell you there. So, Did yeah. you um, have a chance to go on leave? Uh, we went, one time we let sea for, thir for uh, printer, between 30 and 30, 35 days and uh, we were so dizzy, you know, because when you, when you come ashore, you, you felt like you were drunk. You couldn't hardly stand up. You got sea legs. And, yeah, sea legs, yeah. And we stood at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel for three days, I think, you know, mm. and boy, everything, they fed us good <laughs> and trying to fat us, fatten us up and all that. Yeah, that, that's the most memorable. And we went um, surfing out of Waikiki Beach, and I know I, I swam through a uh, Portuguese man at Warsman, and it's a big jellyfish, mm -hmm. and uh, man, my arm swelled up and everything, and it all kind of purple and red dots, you know, on my arm. My arm swelled up. I went back to, to the ship, you know, and they gave me a couple of aspirin. They said, go, go below and take a nap. That's all you can do. <laughs> That's you know, they, they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, did anybody pull any pranks or practical jokes? Well, yeah, big time. When we went across the equator, I was a polywalk. And you go across the equator, you become a shellback, and uh, they just beat the heck out of you. The the the, uh, the, the uh, shellbacks kind of more or less take over the ship, and uh, we had a big. Uh, I can remember this talk about initiation. We had a big slop shoe. It was about oh, four or five foot in diameter, and then for about a week they would throw garbage in there, and you had to crawl through all that all that nasty stuff. And while you was crawling through, guys had like uh, stuff, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like stuff socks, and he would beat the heck out of you, you know, hit you in the head and all, everything else, you know. That was the worst thing, that we had other things dumping in the water and holding you underwater and all that kind of stuff. But uh, then later on when I was on the cruiser, we, we got even with, with a lot of guys, you know, we was a, sh we was a shell back then. So we, uh, we uh, I know that we had Marines aboard then, and the Marines barricaded themselves in, in, a, in a compartment. So we took a fire hose and went in there and sprayed them all down and got their dress blues, you know, their beautiful oh, yeah. uniforms, you know, and we got them all wet. So we, but anyhow, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's something you'll never forget as long as you live. I've been, in, I've been in a few other organizations and I shouldn't say this out loud, but the, the initiation is nothing like when you go across the equator. They, they, they get mean. Yeah, they get kind of crazy, I guess you, you <laughs> might say, <laughs> really. Yeah. So. And you brought some photos to share with us today. Yes, Would yes. you be able to tell us about a few of those? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. These are, when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, these are the battle wagons here. And these are? This is my first ship, my second ship, third ship. This is the Missouri, right here. That's in Yokohama Bay, and we were anchored right along, right alongside of it. And, uh, and of course, you know, we, we, we dropped a bomb, and there's Japanese was working on the bomb. In fact, I think they had five of them in the process, so you know what they would have done. And these are my two discharges. I was in the Korean, too, but I didn't have to go overseas. They made, a, made an instructor out of me up at Great Lakes. So this is my sweetheart later on become my wife. I've been married for 67 years. We just lost her last April, April 17th. So, anyway, like I said, hers, hers, Iwo Jima, the first flag that went up. That was kind of a thrill. But the, the movies, oh, you asked about something in there about the movies? Yes. There was no whistles sounding and stuff like that. We were still under fire. You know, they, they, the movie, I think Iwo Jima said that the movie was something about had uh, a, lot, a lot of people was clapping and, you know, and raising, you know, we, we didn't, didn't that. happen that way. That didn't happen that way because there's a question on there about the movies. Some of these movies are not, not real. They're, they're Hollywood. Yeah. They just, yeah. Anyhow. Do you remember the day that your service ended? Yes, I do. Um, we left um, 
We left Pearl Harbor. We still have some wounded Marines. And we went to Seattle, Washington. And uh, Puget Sound, I think, was. And it was so foggy that we stayed out for three days alongside one of these buoys that the bell kept going day and night. Talk about torture. And see, when, when, when a, a Navy ship goes into a port, you have what you call a, a, a harbor master. He comes out and because uh, they know all the different depths and everything of the harbor so the ship doesn't run, run aground. And we stayed out there, like I said, for three days before the harbor master came out to guide the ship into the dock. Uh -huh. So then from there I went to uh, Great Lakes and that's where I got discharged at the Great Lakes. Okay. So had the war actually come to an end or were you just at oh, the end no. of your service? No, no. The, the war was the war was already over with. Okay. In, in fact, September what, September 3rd, I think it, it ended. And uh, this was December time we got back. Yeah. So. Was anyone else discharged at the same time as you? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but this is hard to say, but I outlived them all so far. We, we see it's all about credit or about uh, reunions and stuff like that. And all my shipmates are going. I mean, everyone, they were all older. I was just a kid. I was 17 when I first went in. See, and all. We had we had one guy. We was coming back from from uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, one of my one of my guys under me, um, he, he was a radio operator, and he threw the phones down like this, and went out and jumped over the side. And uh, this guy was pretty old; he was about 35, 40 years old. He was married, had a couple of daughters, good-looking gals, you know, because he was always proud of the pictures and everything. In fact, he was a caretaker at a golf course, Pebble Beach. In uh, California, he knew uh, he knew Bing Crosby and all those famous people, you know. But, uh, so anyway. well, well, thank you, sir. Boy, I don't get that kind of service very often. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Yeah, but anyhow, what did you do in the days and the weeks right after you were discharged? Look for a job. Sure. Yeah, went to I went to work. Finally, found a job down at Gardner Denver on the third shift. And uh, worked there for for a while, so they laid me off. And then I went out to Oregon, crop dust. My wife then was a telephone operator, and uh, she wouldn't go out with me. She wouldn't move to Oregon, so it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I'd probably killed myself because that's kind of dangerous flying crop duster. But I did it for about a year, and then I, then then I came back, and then, and then that's when I got got the job with the CAA. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so. And you went back to school at some point? Well, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Took a lot of courses and everything. Of course, uh, studied for, for my pilot's license. I'm a commercial pilot. Fly I'm still a flight instructor, still current, too. I'm proud of that. I go over to Mattoon every year and check out other pilots. So, so. Did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you make any close friends? Quite a few, yeah, but they're not with us anymore. Yeah, yeah. Did you have you attended reunions since you? Yes, were? yeah, but we don't have any more because they're gone too. There might be a handful of us left, but we just scattered all over, you know. So, so that's I, know, I can tell you, it's kind of sad. But. <clears throat> Are you a member of any veterans' organizations? Uh, yeah, American Legion. Yeah. What kind of activities do you participate in through that? Well, you know, they have the honor guard and everything for the deceased people, and and they get a lot of projects and cancer and youth and all of that. And so. How has your experience in the service affected your life today? Well, I uh, I respect. My elders and everybody, and especially in the service, I mean, I just, because you give a lot when you go into the service, you really do. People don't realize that you give up your freedom, and freedom is what it's all about. I mean, you just, uh, I just, uh, I, uh, I had a, you're just, uh, what did I, do? I had something written down before I told you say, oh. Yeah, you was going to ask me if there's anything else you'd like to add to it. Yeah, uh, 
keep a very strong military force. I mean, that's number one. I mean, I don't want to get into politics, but boy, I tell you, we, we just don't cut down the military. Don't cut down the military. And stay out of the people's wars. I'm kind of on a bandwagon here, but uh, you can't buy friends. And history repeats itself. I mean, look, look at look at over a year ago uh, where we held up going into Berlin and all that. We held up going in for the Russians to come in, and it looks like, well, like I say, history repeats itself. We better be, better shape up. I mean, really, because we're we're in for it. I hope we don't get in another one, but a big one, you know. But you don't know. Has anyone ever thanked you for your service? Lately they have, yeah. Up to half a dozen years ago, I guess, they didn't hardly recognize the people, but they're starting to realize, you know, what, what the people went through. I think by seeing these later, they don't call them wars, now they call them conflicts, but you see these poor kids come back with missing legs and arms and everything else, and you kind of realize how important World War II was. I mean, we, because they was, they was after us. I mean, they was going to take over. So. How did it make you feel when people thanked you? Proud. Yeah, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like it was, all, it was all worth it. You know, it really does. Yeah. Would you encourage <clears throat> young men and women to enlist today? I would. I would. You get good training. I know it's tough at first, but you learn how to respect other people. How to be worth this ethics and all that? I mean, you under pressure, but I, I would, would, would encourage. You. I wouldn't say I'd encourage a draft unless we get in a big one, but uh, I, I would say it, it's a good place to start, especially these young kids. They they, uh, they just we've got a lot of good kids, but a lot of them don't. They think we owe them a living or something. You got to earn your way. You know, but, uh, so I, what else? Is your view of the government the same before and after oh, your time in the service? You shouldn't ask me that. No, I, I, I'm disappointed in our government nowadays. I'm not, I'm not, I, I think it'd be hard for me right now, my age and everything, or even if I, what I know now to lay my life down for our country. I mean, because we just, it's just, I don't know, it's hard to, hard to say without getting into politics, but uh, we're, we're too wishy-washy on stuff. We really are. I mean, we have so many enemies out there, and they're at, and, you know, they, they're envious of us. And we're trying to teach them how our way of living, and they, they don't want it, you know. And you can't buy friendship. I mean, don't gun it. I mean... I, I, I'm i going to see any more. I'll get, I'll get court-martialed again like <laughs> Admiral Spruce did. <laughs> what is your opinion of the way the history of war is taught in schools today? Well, uh, I know quite a few people, even through, through college, they don't get to World War II. They're still back on the Civil War, which, don't, don't get me wrong, but uh, they, have, they don't follow through. I have, um, I'm still a lifeguard, and I have, I have some um, young kids in college. They never even heard of some of the things that went on in World War II. Uh, I asked this, this one, one young lady, I said, do you ever hear of the, uh, the ship that uh, delivered the atomic, uh, por portions of the atomic bomb to mm -hmm. the island of Tinian? And she says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, so uh, and after they dropped that components off of the atomic bomb, it headed for the Philippines. It didn't have any escort or anything like that, and it got sunk. And uh, this, uh, at midnight, the, the, the Japanese uh, commander, they, they say they have a ritual at midnight. They come up and they pray and all, all of that. And they saw this ship steaming. They thought first it was a destroyer, and it got closer. And uh, they said, well, this is a ship, so they torpedoed it. And uh, 
but she didn't hear anything about that, about the about how many people they lost, and the sharks ate them up, you know, and all that. And, and finally, uh, uh, an airplane on patrol off of one of the islands discovered this oil slick, you know. And uh, then, oh, uh, Captain McNay was the captain on the ship, and uh, he uh, went over to um, uh, base operation to try to get a destroyer for an escort. See, a destroyer has a sonar, where the where a, car where a cruiser and a carrier don't have sonar. They might have today, I don't know, but at that time they didn't have. The sonar is to detect a submarine underwater. And um, so he got impatient, so he took off without an escort, and uh, which was a mistake. And he got court-martialed because he wasn't zigzagging. And he's the only captain that ever got court-martialed during World War II and went to Washington and all that. And um, the, they even brought the Japanese commander. I can't think of his name right now. I did know that at one time. In fact, I got records of that. Uh, brought him from, from Japan over to Washington, D.C. to testify. And he says, in your opinion, uh, would that a target, if he was zigzagging, would you have missed a target? He says, no. He says, because he was dead on, dead on target. So, I mean, then they, were, they finally uh, disregarded the court martial. But later on, he, uh, he had this on his mind for so many years that he finally, he made, he got passed over a couple of times. The officers have a fitness report every, every year, I think it used to be. And uh, he got passed over so many times, but he finally made vice admiral. But he finally took his own life. He shot himself because he just couldn't, he just got to him, you know. He, he could because he lost so many, so many sailors, you know. So, a lot of history out there. A lot of history. What is the most positive thing you took away from your experience? I guess respect for other people and and uh, thank God I'm American. I mean, born in this country and that's, you know, happy to be alive today. So. What is the most negative? <sighs> I don't like to go there, but I guess I covered that a little bit the way our government's working now. You know, I don't want to throw cold water on this situation, but uh, I'm kind of disappointed. We, uh, we, and um, I'm kind of disappointed where the, the young people don't have respect for your elders, you know, and all that. But other than that, that takes a lot of training. That takes a training of the parents. I'm going to get in I'm going to get heck for this or saying all of this. But you ask me, and I'm, it's true. Yeah. So. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us today that we haven't asked you about? No, I think I said enough. Really. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think I covered everything. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Thank you for being with us today. You're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope uh, we succeed our country succeeds and we don't get too much trouble that we can handle it. I hope we don't get in another another war with that kind of concerns me with all the countries that got the atomic bombs and stuff and when they start doing that look out you know because I don't know we better think about it though because uh, we have a lot of enemies out there and I'll repeat, you can't buy friendship and keep our military strong. That's my my think my personal thinking. Don't don't weaken us because these other countries they don't they don't have any respect for a weak country. They have respect for a strong country. Fear. I mean you don't like to use that word, but you when you negotiate on the table you better have something to back it up. No red lines to cross. You better be. You say a red line, you better back it up. Get my message? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.